Hello, welcome to The Conversation and New Central Television. This is the programme where we bring you up to date with all the political happenings on the African continent. I am Benga Aboroa. And I am Rita Omodye. And we have a two stories packed for you for this edition of The Conversation. But around the continent, we still have situations in Kenya where the election petition tribunal is still going on and about 15 polling stations are being recounted due to discrepancies of election results as petitioned by the opposition candidate, Ryla Odinga. Uh, we expect the Supreme Court to give a verdict yes. uh, soon and also the Angolan uh, elections. It, just it seems like the, for every election now, the opposition is not yeah, taking the it results. It seems to be contested all the time, yeah. All right, so let's begin with today's edition of the conversation where we switch situations on the UK Rwanda asylum deal and, of course, situations in Nigeria. Now, on the program today, we will be looking at the issues with the UK Rwanda asylum as we understand that many of the asylum seekers scheduled to scheduled by the United Kingdom for deportation to Rwanda have been victims of torture. Uh, what a sad one there. Definitely a sad one. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, a governor in the southern part of the country, Governor Inge Samwike of River State, has threatened to help the main opposition party, the People's Democratic Party, lose 2023 elections. We all know that 2023 is just around the corner and the opposition party has not been in power since 2015. Mm. And you would expect that all hands would be on deck and that the PDP will try as much as possible to resolve all these fractions and aggrieved members going on the party. It's yeah, like, all like in some weekend. Yes, like they say, a divided house can't stand on its own. So um, we'll be looking at that situation closely. Now, the UK Rwanda asylum deal is no longer news as it has generated reactions from different quarters. But there's a new development as revealed by a medical charity uh, doctors, uh, doctors for medical justice, a British charity advocating for better health rights for detainees, said it had conducted clinical assessments of 17 people told by the United Kingdom Home Office that they would be sent to Rwanda before the government's widely condemned expulsion plan faces a challenge in Britain's top court. And shockingly, out of 17 asylum seekers, 14 showed clinical evidence of having suffered torture. Meanwhile, 14 of the migrants had clinical evidence that they had been tortured, the medical justice said, while 15 of them had post-traumatic stress or other complex health problems. The UK government in April announced it had reached an agreement with Rwanda to send asylum seekers to the Southeast African country to have their claims dealt with there. Migrants who have traveled through a third safe country or taken illegal routes to the UK are eligible for deportation to Rwanda. The government said the scheme will help end people smuggling and dangerous crossings off the English Channel. Now, joining us for this conversation, we have Emma Jean. She is the Director of Medical Justice from London and Calvin Dock, a Global Affairs Analyst. He joins us from Washington, D.C. Lady and gentlemen, welcome to the conversation. Good to be here. Now, I'll start with you, uh, Calvin. Now, can you tell us what was the methodology involved in the report titled Who's Paying the Price? I mean, these are serious situations going on with the UK-Rwanda deal, I would say. So, so I, I, I believe that question should be directed to Emma because she works uh, yeah. for the medical charity, uh, Medical Justice. So uh, who's paying the price, the human cost of the Rwandan removals? That was the title of this report that we're discussing on. How did your organization, uh, Medical Justice, come about this findings? Yeah, we send um, volunteer doctors into immigration removal centers to document people's scars of tort medical mistreatment. And out of 51 clients who have contacted us who have had a notice of intent to be removed to Rwanda, um, we've done a comprehensive analysis on 36 of them. And they are very largely vulnerable people, as you suggested, torture and trafficking victims. And our medical assessments and other information shows that um, the harm inflicted on them 
in UK immigration detention centres. This includes the deterioration that they suffer in the detentions per se anyway, and also the additional impact of the threat of removal to Rwanda, which of course is obviously very acute for people who are so vulnerable. And that's why we say that even before any flight has taken off to Rwanda, they're already paying a very high human cost for it. Uh, uh, just before we move to Calvin, what were some of the key findings of your report? Yes, we've um, out of 17 people that we did a, a medical assessment on, um, as you said, that 14 of them had evidence of, of torture and six of indicators of, of trafficking. Um, 15 had a diagnosis or symptoms of PTSD. One was had a psychotic disorder and likely to... Um, uh, lack the ability to instruct a solicitor, and one had um, needed investigations about a, a brain tumour. Eleven people had suicidal thoughts, including one person who had attempted suicide twice, and many of them were clinically considered to be at a very high risk of suicide if they were threatened to be being put on a flight. We also found that the process that they were subjected to was really accelerated, very, very quick, very um, confusing. Many of them didn't have access to the legal advice they needed and didn't, in fact, really understand what was happening to them at all. And one of the key points is that there doesn't seem to be any specific criteria about who can be removed to Rwanda. So it could include men, women, children, torture survivors, um, there doesn't seem to be anyone out of bounds or off limits, as it were, to be deported to Rwanda, which is extremely worrying. And there's no specific screening for those, any vulnerabilities um, regarding being sent to Rwanda, even though the UK government admits that it might not be appropriate to send everyone. They don't have a mechanism to be checking that. All right, thank you so much, Emma. I would like to hear from Calvin now, because Emma has mentioned so many allegations there, talking about brain, tu brain tumour of these people, suicidal thoughts, and even the process that were accelerated for these people who are supposed to be uh, removed to Rwanda. And this is just one organisation, but we've had a number of human rights organisations and personalities who have described this plan by the UK Home Secretary, Priti Patel, to send asylum seekers to Rwanda as evil and inhumane amid fierce criticism from refugee charities saying the move is ill-conceived. Calvin, how do you describe the Rwanda policy? Well, I think ill-conceived is a perfect word. Um, you know, let's step back just a moment. So one of the things, obviously with this group of um, migrants that are, you know, proposed to go to Rwanda, the issues that they're facing, that's clearly not the humane treatment for them. But for any um, migrant seeking asylum, this is not the answer. First of all, we have to remember the UK has an international law obligation to deal with asylum seekers, and it doesn't include writing a check and sending them thousands of miles away. Also, we have to think about the fact that Rwanda has its own challenges. There are are people there that need help that, you know, I'm reading uh, media reports that they're being displaced or kind of knocked off priority for the potential for these um, migrants coming from the UK. And it really shows when you talk about the ill-conceived part, as we were just discussing, there are so many issues regarded to their health, how they will be able to assimilate, you know, the fact that even if successful, this would talk about a very, very small percentage of migrants trying to come to the UK. So I think ill-conceived is a very, very appropriate term. Then Calvin, if it is ill-conceived, why do you think the UK government is still bent on having this asylum seekers sent to Rwanda? I mean, this case has been on for months now going on and the UK is still adamant on sending these asylum seekers to Rwanda. Well, I think it's a political move. I think that with those in power in the UK, they want to send a message that um, they, they don't want to have these migrants coming into their country. Now, of course, that brings up other issues for migrants who are there legally in the UK, the stigma that may be attached to them, um, that it, it foments this, um, these feelings, anti-immigrant feelings for them. So while it is ill-conceived, as I was saying, from a political standpoint, it works for their audiences to make it look as if they are really addressing the migrant situation but we see from this report and we see from all of the factors that they clearly haven't considered that this isn't really solving the actual problem.
Now, Emma, the British ambassador to Rwanda uh, advised against this move and officials in the Foreign Office have also advised against it. Uh, and uh, looking at Rwanda's uh, refugee policies, not exactly uh, one of the nicest places to send refugees to in 2000. And, uh, a, a few years ago, they did open fire on some group of protesting uh, refugees in front of the UNHCR office there. So what's in it for the United Kingdom? Why are they uh, so against popular opinion and all of this advice, uh, they still insist on sending refugees to Rwanda? Well, I think Kelvin's really sort of um, hit the nail on the head in terms of the motivation. Um, the government has been pretty clear that it's about deterrence, um, which is appalling to punish one group of people to uh, apparently deter another group of people, quite apart from the fact that it won't work. And what it is doing is sending ripples of fear through communities. So it's not just those in detention, but they're also targeting people outside of detention as well, issuing notices of intent to remove to Rwanda to um, asylum seekers that are being kept in, in hotels. And of course, you know, the outcome of this is to send a message of fear um, through all of those communities. But as has already been alluded to, it, it's, it's, it's not particularly practical and it's definitely not um, the right way to do things at all. Okay, Calvin, I believe this case is coming back on Monday uh, after the first flight was suspended from the UK court. Now, do you think that these uh, processes, this case and this allegation that have been brought forward of people who are being tortured, uh, being sent for asylum seeking in Rwanda, do you think that it will have an impact on the case in court? It could. I don't think that it necessarily will. And the reason is, is that while these issues are extremely troubling, um, you know, before we knew that, we knew how troubling this whole scheme was. So I don't know if that would necessarily change the calculation. Now, I do think what it may do, as far as public opinion goes, it shows the public just some of the many flaws in this plan and how not only does it really not affect the migration issues in the UK, but that it doesn't address the plight of these people who are seeking you know, a better situation. So while it may not change legally, what we may end up seeing is that what the public response may pressure the politicians to delay or scale down or push forward um, to a future date what they're actually doing. But now I will say this, with the, with the current leaders in the UK, if they have their way and there isn't sufficient um, public sentiment, I can see them clearly going forward as they um, plan to do, if the court allows them to. Now, Emma, Rwanda's Foreign Affairs Minister, Vincent Baruta, has said uh, the agreement is about ensuring that people are protected, respected and empowered to further their own ambitions and settle permanently in Rwanda if they choose. He said his country is already home to more than 130,000 refugees from countries like Burundi, Congo, Libya and Pakistan. Does this make Rwanda an ideal destination to offshore asylum seekers based on on Rwanda's record uh, that the foreign minister uh, gave. Hello, Emma, I think your, mic is, your microphone is on mute. Is that better now? Okay, great. I think it's pretty unconvincing considering the number of reports that have come in from different places. Um, also, the people being subjected to this policy um, themselves know um, from their own experiences or, or that of pe other people that have been removed to Rwanda um, that it's not a, a, a safe place for them to go. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it doesn't really ring true and um, it's against advice from, from so many different quarters. So, Emma, two things are happening on Monday. The court is going to deliberate on this. And on Monday, the United Kingdom is going to get a new prime minister, it's either uh, Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak. Will this effectively put an end to the Rwanda deal? Or it's, yes. Um, it, it's, re it's real unknown because both of those candidates have been crowing about how they want to make 
the Rwanda deal um, work and they say, come what may, which is kind of, you know, warlike type rhetoric, i.e., you know, mm. to hell with the evidence, whatever the evidence suggests, we're going to do it in any case. So they've both indicated that they want to go forward with the program. I think Liz Truss has also said that she wanted to look at other countries as well. So it doesn't bode too well. But that said, there are um, a lot of schemes that have been trumpeted in the past that don't actually go forward um, because they don't actually work and they're not actually practical. So um, I think it, it's a really massive question mark um, and, and it's incredibly concerning. Okay, I'm going to throw that question back to Calvin, Lee Strauss, we have Rishi. And, you know, a lot of issues came up with Boris Johnson's administration, the violation of the COVID-19, and, of course, the MPs all voting against him. I mean, how do you see this playing out? Well, from what I've seen, it, it looks as if they would continue the program, or at least, you know, they may not champion it as much as Boris Johnson did, but they really don't, I don't think they'll really change it. Now, of course, if the decision in the court and other political factors just make it untenable, there's a possibility that it could be, um, you know, kick, kick the can down the road, as we say here in the United States. But now from a political standpoint, I just want to say that, you know, this is a common, uh, unfortunately, a common scheme. Um, we're seeing it in our own country. The governor of Texas is busing migrants daily to New York, Chicago and Washington, D.C., in our nation's capital. So I unfortunately see this being a continuing thing with the new leadership we have in the UK. I just hope public pressure and just, you know, the things like this report and other things that I don't think were really thought through in this policy come to light to change public opinion and hopefully lawmaker opinion. Now, now Calvin, we still saw the UK ambassador to Rwanda advising against this asylum deal. Are we seeing divisions? Yes. And, you know, of course, there are divisions in British society, but I think the British ambassador to, to British ambassador to Rwanda is key because you know he's on the ground. He knows the situation. You know he knows that Rwanda is dealing with his own challenges with displaced people and people that they are trying to help. Other asylum seekers from other countries, and I think that um, the British ambassador's opinion and and feedback should be taken into account by lawmakers because he's the presence on the ground and can probably see the many ways that this doesn't help migrants or really help the UK. Now, Emma, uh, thank you, Calvin. Emma, the United Kingdom does have a, a migrant problem. Uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, says the threat of a one-way ticket to Rwanda will save countless lives by deterring migrants from trying to cross the channel in dangers and also put uh, traffickers out of business. In the report uh, your organization did, it also mentioned people uh, that were victims of traffickers. Do you agree with him that it will reduce exploitation by making the UK a no longer viable option to smuggle vulnerable people? Because if you look at the Australian, I mean, UK is not the first to do this. If you look at uh, Australia's offshoring of refugees to Manaus and uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, the records speak for itself. Uh, it has served as a deterrent. Uh, don't you think the same thing would happen if uh, refugees were sent to Rwanda? Well, I think there's quite a large risk that it could increase the amount of, of trafficking that people are subjected to, because if you're shipping them off 4,000 miles from, by force to, from the place where they wanted to be, um, I think it, it, it's there's a, a real risk that that um, people will not stay in Rwanda and will end up being trafficked. And I think that that has um, there are suggestions that that has happened with other countries that and other situations where people have been sent to Rwanda and they didn't stay in Rwanda um, and traffickers were involved in that. So I, I don't I, I think there's a very big risk with it. Um, and it's certainly not acting as a deterrent so far because the reasons that people have to come to the UK are so compelling. Um, and those reasons would need to be addressed, a very deep and complex um, situation. Um, I don't think this is a, a plan that's going to reduce trafficking. I think it could increase it. OK, Calvin. Emma is saying that this plan will rather increase it. We've seen lots of people dying going on this treacherous journey of the Mediterranean Sea. 
We see people dying in Libya and all that. What options does the UK have in dealing with illegal traffickers and the wave of asylum seekers that cross the channel from France? You know, I am not a migration expert, but as I've been looking at this situation, I can think of two things that they could do that would at least contribute to bettering the situation. One is the millions of pounds that are being spent on this program to resettle people in Rwanda. How about use that money to try to address the factors that are making people from the countries of origin come to the UK, come to France? Like, if you're going to spend the money, spend it that way. The second part is, if this is going to be a deterrent, why are not we deterring the people who are doing the trafficking? You know, this has always been cast as deterring people who are being trafficked. We know that the factors that made them take these dangerous journeys are pushing them to do it. If the UK is really serious, go after the um, traffickers, send them somewhere. Maybe that will deter people and improve the situation in the long term. Now, Emma, your organization, Medical Justice, has uh, been at the forefront of the humane treatment of refugees, and you're quite invested uh, in this. Are you hopeful that the decision will be overturned uh, by the court, or will the United Kingdom just damn the consequences and go ahead without showing refugees, uh, even though it's against the United Nations Refugee Convention, like Australia has successfully done? I don't know. We remain hopeful, um, have to remain hopeful um, that putting um, all the evidence in front of the court that the, the, the people bringing the case um, next week are doing um, will have uh, um, the right, that the judges will come to the right decision. Um, we still have hope that that will happen um, and we'll continue to gather the evidence. Okay, what about you, Calvin? Do you think there should be more international pressure? We've seen medical justice, we've seen other civil society organizations talk against this. Uh, what more pressure can be done to probably make this deal not go? Well, I think in an ideal world, there should be an international outcry from other world powers to you know, talk about how this is exactly what you don't do to fulfill your obligations to migrants as they're doing in the UK. The problem is, is that I can't think of a world power that would have that voice that has any room to talk, including my own country, including France and others. So I do think there needs to be international pressure, but we're not looking at a situation where there are real success stories of people that have the credibility to criticize the UK government and offer um, sustainable solutions. Now, Emma, just before we let you go, uh, I mean, the consensus has been, you know, this is a bad deal. Uh, quite a lot of religious leaders, human rights organizations, NGOs, uh, the general consensus, it's, it's an ill-conceived deal and it's bad on the surface. But, I mean, for somebody that risked their lives crossing the Mediterranean and then crossing the English Channel that has been through a war situation, don't you think there might be an upside uh, to this uh, Rwanda asylum deal, and uh, Rwanda might just provide them another opportunity at life. Do you see any upside in this? Well, if you speak to the people involved, no one has voiced a possible upside <laughs> to it. Um, people uh, are expressing that it's a massive downside and they're terrified, um, and the impact on them is really profound. Um, so, no, I don't think that, I don't think anyone that intended to come to the UK and suddenly finds themselves removed um, to so far away that could possibly remotely anyone could imagine that there could be an upside to it. Certainly that's not been expressed by any of our clients. Okay. okay. What, what about you, Calvin? Do you see any upside? I mean, don't you think the UK is just protecting its own interest? Yes. And the only upside I can think of is that maybe with their international pressure and attention, we can kind of see how these types of schemes don't work. And hopefully, and I'm being optimistic here, that it will encourage countries to think about more sustainable solutions and not ones that are so ill-conceived as this one. Thank you very much, uh, Emma Jin and Calvin Duck, for being a part of today's conversation. We do appreciate you. your time and contribution. Thank you. Thank you.